What's up everybody? Ryan Pulis here from the Pulis Group with today's real estate tax tips. We're a tax and accounting firm specializing in tax planning for real estate investors and small business owners. Today we're going to discuss Form 8824, Like Kind Exchange. This is the form used to report a 1031 exchange on your tax return. So let's start with a brief review of the uh, 1031 rules. So a 1031 exchange defers capital gains and depreciation recapture on the exchange of real estate as long as certain conditions and rules are followed. So Internal Revenue Code Section 1031A1 says, no gain or loss shall be recognized on the exchange of property held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment if such property is exchanged solely for property of like kind, which is to be held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment. So property in this case is referring to real property. The in incidental personal property is allowed as long as the total value included does not exceed 15% of the replacement property's fair market value. There was some confusion around this area when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act first passed, eliminating, or I should say restricting the 1031 exchange to real estate or real property only. So to qualify for deferred tax treatment, you have to follow certain rules. First, a qualified intermediary must be used to handle all the paperwork and hold the sale proceeds during the exchange period. The investor can't receive or take control of any of the funds from the sale of their original property, the, the relinquished property is what it's generally referred to. The funds must go to and remain with the qualified intermediary until the transaction is complete. This rule is crucial and it can ruin the whole deal if it's not properly followed. Second, <clears throat> excuse me, the property must be held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment. So this means items of in inventory do not count, such as fix and flip properties. If you're considered a dealer, the homes are considered inventory and don't qualify for a 1031 exchange. Uh, another disqualified uh, piece of real estate would be your primary residence. It's not a, tra a trader business and it's not an investment. It's a personal asset and therefore does not qualify. Next, the replacement property must have a purchase price equal to or greater than the selling price of the relinquished property. The full selling proceeds, full sales proceeds must be invested into the new property. So you can't just reinvest the gains. It has to be the entire amount from the sale. If there's a loan on the property, you'll need to use as much or more debt to finance the replacement property. In short, you can't take out any cash from the deal if you want to keep it entirely tax free or tax deferred. Any cash taken out will be taxable. It's referred to as boot. Next, we have the same taxpayer rule. So the same person or entity must be listed on both the relinquished property and the replacement property. If you hold the relinquished property in an LLC, the same LLC must buy the new property. <clears throat> there, are a few, there, there is an exception to the rule for a single member LLC disregarded from their owner. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the next two rules are the 45 day and 180 day rule which run concurrently, generally starting when you, the date you sell your original property. The 45 day rule says that you have 45 calendar days to identify replacement properties. In the vast majority of 1031 exchanges, taxpayers use the three day, or three, I'm sorry, three property rule, which allows you to identify up to three replacement properties in that 45 day window. And you have to end up purchasing one of those properties. <clears throat> You are allowed to identify more than three properties, but there's additional restrictions and it's less common, so we're not gonna go into that today. You can always contact us to learn more. The 180 day rule says the entire transaction must be completed by the earlier of 180 calendar days or the due date of your tax return, including extensions. So both these rules, the 45 and 180 day rule, uh, or calendar days. So be careful because if the final day falls on a holiday and the uh, intermediary or the banks aren't open to uh, complete the transaction, then you want to make sure you have it done before that deadline. So let's take a, let's take a look at a quick example and see how uh, <clears throat> this would play out for Johnny. So Johnny owns a rental 
at One Nunchuck Drive, the relinquished property, with a fair market value of $200,000 and an adjusted basis of $134,919. Including, included in that adjusted basis number is $30,000 allocated to the land. On June 30th, 2021, Nunchuck Drive is exchanged starting the 45 and 180 day clocks. Property at 567 Samurai Streets identified as the replacement property on August 1st, 2021, which satisfi satisfies the 45 day rule. And the, prop the new properties received on October 31st, 2021, satisfying the 180 day rule. So that occurred within 180 days from the, uh, the starting date of June 30th. So we're all good there. The Samurai Street property has a fair market value of 300,000 as compared to the 200,000 fair market value of the Nunchuck property he's giving up. So Johnny brings $120,000 cash to the deal to cover selling costs of 20,000 and that $100,000 difference in fair market value, the 300,000 new property minus the old property fair market value of 200,000 is where we get that $100,000. So this $120,000 cash he brings to the deal is referred to as additional basis or sometimes referred to as excess basis. He's putting in more money, so that's increasing his basis in the new property. So his total new, ba new basis is gonna be the $120,000 additional basis, which is the cash Johnny puts into the deal, plus his carryover basis from the old property of $134,919. That gives us a total of $254,919 total basis in the Samurai Street property. So if we look, if we take the $300,000 fair market value of the property minus this total basis of $254,919, there's a gain of $45,081 on the deal. So that's the amount we can potentially defer under Section 1031. So let's take a look at Form 8824 and see how these numbers would show up. We're going to use the same numbers from this example we just looked at. So here we go. <clears throat> Here's a sample Form 8824. So up in the top, part one covers general information of the exchange. There's a description of the properties involved, ver the various dates involved in, an exchange, in the exchange, and whether or not the deal <coughs> involves related parties. So if, if related parties were involved, which they're not in our case, that, that information would be reported in part two. So we're going to skip over that for now. Now here in part three is where the realized and recognized gains show up. <clears throat> when the entire gain qualifies for deferral, the recognized gain will be zero. So when we're talking about 1031 exchanges, a realized gain is simply the amount of gain an investor has from selling the asset, regardless whether it's taxable or not. A recognized gain is the taxable portion of the realized gain. So when the entire 1031 exchange qualifies for tax deferral, the amount recognized will be zero. Now line 12 to, 12 to 14 are only used if there's property of not a like kind involved. So let's say for example, there was a truck traded in there with the two properties um, that doesn't apply to our example. So we, we don't have anything in lines 12 to 14. Line 15 is for cash received or liabilities assumed which are, is treated similar to receiving cash. This too is zero in our example because if Johnny receives cash, then that becomes taxable boot. Line 16 is where we, where we report the fair market value of the property received. So in Johnny's case, it's the $300,000 value of the Samurai property. Line 17 is simply the sum of line 15 and 16. Next on line 18 is the adjusted basis of the property given up, which in our example includes that cash that he brought to the table. So this is the 254,919 we calculated earlier, which is the old basis in the Nunchuck property and the old, the old property that he traded, the 134,919 plus the $120,000 cash. Line 19 is the realized gain and is calculated by subtracting line 18 from line 17 above. 
line 20 reports the lesser of line 15 and line 19, so zero in our case because 15 is zero. Line 21 is where you'd report income from recapture rules, which that two does not apply to our example. Line 22 is another calculation on the form. It's simply subtracting line 21 from line 20. And next on line 23, this reports the recognized gain by adding lines 21 and 22. We have no recognized gain in our example because the entire transaction qualifies for deferral. Had Johnny received cash on this deal then or pulled some money out, then a portion of the gain would be taxable. And we'd see a, a number here. Line 24 reports the deferred gain on the exchange, which is equal to line 19 because we have no gain to recognize. And finally, on line 25, we show the basis in the new property. So for Johnny, this is that 254.919 from line 18. Uh, part 4 deals with uh, section 1043 gains, and it's, it has nothing to do with what we're covering today, so we'll skip over that part. So next, we're going to look at how the replacement property is depreciated. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> so you have two pieces of the new property to consider when it comes to depreciation in a like kind exchange, assuming no cost segregation study is done. So in our example, we don't have a cost seg study done. We're just keeping it simple today. You have the carryover basis, which is the adjusted basis from the old property at the time of the exchange. And you also have the second piece is the additional basis, sometimes referred to as excess basis. So from our example, the carryover basis was that $134,919 from the old property. And the additional basis is the $120,000 from the cash that Johnny put into the deal. There are two options for depreciating the carryover basis of a property acquired in a like kind exchange. The general rules under regulation section 1.168i require you to depreciate the carryover basis over the remaining recovery period of the relinquished property or the old property. So for example, a 27 and a half year property exchanged in year 10 would result in a carryover basis being depreciated over the remaining 17.5 years. Any additional basis is treated as newly placed in service property and depreciation starts fresh in year one. So under the general rules, depreciation must be calculated separately for the carryover basis and the additional or excess basis. You're gonna have two, uh, two different assets on the books to depreciate. Now you can make an election to use a simplified method, which allows you to combine the carryover and excess basis and treat both as if they're placed in service on the date the replacement property is uh, acquired. So you make the election by attaching a statement to your return indicating the election's been made under section 1.168i-6i and you in, in include a description of the property with that election. So you list the property and the address. So let's take a look at a sample depreciation report using the numbers from our example and we'll look at both methods discussed above and how, they, uh, how they're going to show up. So here we have the first sample depreciation report which uses the general rules and reports two separate assets. The first line shows a carryover basis of 134919 30,000 of that was allocated to land from our original asset. The second asset on this report is the additional basis. So in this uh, example, I, I assume $20,000 of the additional basis should also be allocated to land. So we have a total land value on this new property of $50,000. And the total basis of 254,919 ties back to line 25 of the form 8824 that we looked at earlier. Okay, so this, whoops, what did I do here? There we go. Keep losing it. Okay, so our, 
Second depreciation report combines the carryover in excess basis into a single asset, and the amount, the total was still the same, 254,919, with $50,000 allocated to land. In this case, we're electing out of the Section 1.168I, 6I regs, uh, and again, the total basis at 254,919 ties back to line 25 of Form 8824. Remember, we're starting the asset life, life over for the carryover basis. So for simplicity in our example, we have no cost seg study and the entire basis is depreciated over 27 and a half years. Johnny'd want to pass on using the simplified method in, in this case because there's a higher depreciation using the general rules and continuing with the old asset life on the carryover basis. And that's simply because on the carryover basis, you have less years remaining to depreciate that total value when under the simplified method you kind of start that clock over uh, with a 27 and a half year asset because we're talking about residential real estate. Um, a quick note on cost seg studies with section 1031 when the general general rules are used a cost seg study is only permitted on the new property so the additional basis you can't do a cost seg on the carryover basis when we're using the uh, general rules and depreciating two assets. Um, and also on the, when we're using the simplified option, the tax rules do allow a cost seg study to apply to the combined carryover and additional basis. So you, you want to do a little, run, run the numbers and do a little planning to see what's going to be the best outcome in your situation. Um, a quick note though, on the, the when it comes to bonus depreciation, that is only allowed to be applied to additional basis regardless whether we're using the general option or the simplified. So now we come back to recap. Just briefly go over what we talked about today. The 1031 exchange allows investors to defer capital gains and depreciation recapture on the exchange of like-kind real property. There are strict rules involved in doing so. Form 8824 is used to report the 1031 exchange on your return. Line 19 of Form 8824 shows the realized gain and line 23 will show recognized gain, if any. And line 25 shows your total basis, a carryover plus excess or additional basis in the new property. There are two options for depreciating the new property and careful planning should be used to determine which, is, which will result in the best outcome for you. Performing a 1031 exchange is not something you're gonna to wanna to try to do on your own. Be sure you're working with professionals to make sure everything goes smoothly. So that about wraps up our discussion today on Form 8824. I hope this video was helpful. Feel free to comment below and hit the like and subscribe button. We are taking on new clients and we'll review your prior tax year prior tax returns for planning opportunities. If you'd like to work with us, then hit us up on our webpage at thepulisgroup.com forward slash contact. That's T-H-E-P-U-L-I-C-E-G-R-O-U-P dot com forward slash contact. Thank you and have a good day.